Conservative commentator Guy Benson, who also happens to be gay, recently lit the conservative internet uh, blogosphere on fire recently when he announced that he was having a kid with his husband via surrogacy. Now, this has spawned a variety of different reactions, some ranging from congratulatory, but the vast majority ranging from accusatory, and some of them being, for example, that he is robbing a baby of the, the mother, another being that he is renting a womb, another being that he is doing something that is unnatural and not ordained by the natural order. But out of all these reactions, I think Matt Walsh's reaction has been the most intriguing not because it has the most depth to it, it certainly doesn't, but because it's probably the most visceral in the terms it, it describes this issue. Now, this is the issue of surrogacy, but also the issue of gay couples adopting. And I figured that no one on the right has really articulated a case, a pro-family case, a, 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 a sort of traditional values case for gay couples and for the kind of arrangement that Guy Benson and his, argument and his husband have. I'm most certainly an American conservative. I'm a conservative in the American sense that I believe that there are universal principles that are inherent to the nature of things that must be conserved if we're to have a good society and if individuals are to have a good life. So I'm not attacking Walsh as a leftist. I think Walsh sometimes has good things to say, although my main criticism of him is that he oftentimes lacks the needed depth to navigate these very pressing issues. And so I'm going to respond to him from a conservative lens and I'm just going to analyze a clip of what he said. And for those of you who are wondering, the context of the clip is very simple. He's talking about the issue of surrogacy and gay couples adopting all together in one. And so I have no presumptions. I just want to analyze this and perhaps give Walsh and other people who may follow him, rather conservatives, a different way to think about this very complex moral issue. So without further ado, let's see what he has to say. Now, if you are not the perceptive sort, you might listen to all this and say, well, this is unfair to gay couples. What if they want to, uh, to have children? What, what are they supposed to do? Don't we need to have some kind of system in place to help them achieve their parenthood dreams? The answer to that question is no, we don't. Homosexual unions are sterile by their nature. It's not an exception to the rule when they are. It's not the result of sickness or genetic defect when a homosexual couple is unable to have children. None of them are able, or have ever been able, or ever will be able. That is a sign from nature, about as glaring and obvious as signs as you can never see, that gay couples are not meant to have kids. They're not meant to have kids because they cannot ever have kids, because kids are meant to have both a mom and a dad. All right, so let's stop right there. So I, I think Walsh's assertion here is a mixture of a bunch of different issues, a bunch of different dis disparate issues placed into one single assertion and then given towards the audience without any justification. If you're going to make an assertion, you must provide justification. Let's start with one of the issues I think he's talking about, the moral domain here. He talks about nature. Now, for those of you who watch my, my videos and know about my work, I am someone who very much believes in the idea of natural law, particularly if I'm going to be true to the intellectual history of the idea here. I believe in the idea of 18th century enlightenment natural law, the kind of natural law that was postulated by the types like Lord Kames of the Scottish Enlightenment, who was in correspondence with Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, um, John Locke, uh, Hugo Grotius, who was a Dutch man who actually inspired Locke. He came before Locke and created the sort of basis for Enlightenment natural law theory that came from the Spanish scholastics and so on and so forth. That's the school of thought that I am in. That's the school of thought that our founders were in. And that's the school of thought that influenced the, mor influenced the moral character of America. And so I am very sensitive and appreciative of moral claims that rest on natural law on this channel. Whenever I talk about morality or society, I will almost invariably invoke natural law because I think that it is, it is an objective basis by which to assess the condition of certain issues in society. But having said that, I think while I think Walsh's intuition is absolutely correct, the way he ta understands it and the way he goes about applying it is where we have a, a big issue. His intuition is to say, since it's not, since homosexuals cannot reproduce, nature is saying something. But this confuses a, a, a very important, two important concepts that actually allow us to deduce moral ideas from nature. This confuses capacity for competency. What do I mean? 
Well, it is true that homosexuals don't have the capacity, by their by definition, to produce children. But he then ties that into a value judgment about them, their status of not supposing to be parents because they lack that, co that, that capacity to produce a child. But capacity and competency are two different things. I may have the capacity, for example, to think, but that does not mean I'm a great thinker. I may have the capacity to drive. That does not mean I'm a good driver. My thinking could get tied up in alcoholism. It could get tied up in propaganda, indoctrination. It could get tied up in all manner of things that degrades my ability to think, but my capacity is still there. Being a parent or not being a parent has nothing to do with your capacity to produce children and everything to do with the competency you show in understanding just what your duty as a parent is. A parent's duty is to invest their soul, invest themselves into the child that they help shepherd into the world through whatever means, IVF, pregnancy, we'll get to that in a second. And by investing your soul into that child's soul, you help them become the best they can be throughout life. There are a lot of folks who have the capacity to reproduce that aren't competent parents and have no business reproducing, to be honest with you. But if we were to take Walsh's idea literally here, that gay couples not being able to reproduce means they can't be parents at all, then we would have to bind the idea of parenthood away from its spiritual connotations, which is going to be investing in the child and bringing them up through life, and put it solely towards a materialistic and biological connotation, which is just not the case. Those are two categorically distinct things. I also think that it's wrong to deduce moral intelligibility from capacity. Just because you have the capacity to think Again, does not mean your thoughts are going to be good or more. You could have you could have evil or iniquitous thoughts. It is always wrong to do that because capacity is the default. It's the system factory settings to use computer terminology. It is not the structure. It is not the content of one's actions. It's not the content of one's character. It's not the content of one's thinking. So that's a very big confusion here that takes a sensibility about nature, which is correct, but then take it toward the conclusion, which is an invariably incorrect, and then mixes that with his own biases as to what he believes constitutes a parent, as opposed to looking at what it actually means to be a parent. So it, 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 it's a subjective preference mixed in with an appeal to the universal, which actually misses the universal itself. And a lot of conservatives are using this kind of argument. But if you're a conservative... Your, your, the emphasis of your thinking can't just be on tradition alone. It has to be on the subterranean bedrock of those traditions. Because any tradition can be good or bad. A tradition is not good just because it exists. A tradition is justified by its relationship with the eternal, with the principle, with the universal. Not with its relationship to the subjective. That's something that Walsh really hasn't worked out here that he needs to because it's impairing his ability to get through this in a morally sound way. So I reject wholesale that because gay parents can't have kids at the capacity must mean they can't take the role of a parent. That's not the case whatsoever. Uh, that's not even, it's a non sequitur if you ask me. And it's a confusion of moral terms and a mixture of bias with that confusion. So let's continue on to see what Matt Walsh has to say about this issue. Continue. Now, it's true that plenty of kids end up with just one of those or sometimes none, but this just means that something went wrong. In that case, you do your best, the best you can to compensate. But with surrogacy, we are designing children from the outset to be motherless or fatherless. We are intentionally depriving them um, of, of, of what they are supposed to have. Let's stop right there. So he claims that surrogacy intentionally deprives a child of a mother or a father. I think this is where the tension uh, of the ideal and the actual come into play. Well, it's the sort of platonic ideal of what a family should be and the actual reality for so many different Americans. It is true that, and, and there's something he's touching on that's very important. It's true that it is best for a child 
to have feminine influences and masculine influences in their life. And it's true that in a biological sense, in the beginning stages of life, a child can more easily get those feminine influences from the mother. But having said that, there are many ways to deliver the influences a child needs to, to, to understand the world and to prosper that go beyond simply having a mother in the household. Uh, I, and, and this is one of the things that I really don't, don't really, really appreciate about how this issue is being taken on. Ch we, we understand specifically that children grow up to prosper and flourish when they have two parents in the home, including parents who happen to be homosexual. Then if they have a single mother in the home, single mother kids have the worst outcomes of even kids that have single fathers. That's a very serious issue. And that's a very and that's an issue that we have to take into account seriously. So when you have that combined nuclear family, there is more of an opportunity for the child to get the influences that he needs to be a well-rounded individual, or she needs to be a well-rounded individual. You're not really robbing anyone of anything. You're simply introducing those influences to the child in a manner that is different than what a lot of traditionalists might might prefer because they have a certain conception of the ideal that they wish that they, they think is necessary for every single person to flourish. You may have a kid that has two parents, heterosexual parents, who doesn't get what they need from that union. You may have a kid that has uh, one parent who may get what he needs, and th as is the case, as this is the case for me from outside role models that he knew in his personal life that could help build him up, uncles, aunts, coaches. This is the case for me. I'm, I'm born of a single parent uh, household, and that's how I was able to overcome that marginal difficulty that I had not having the masculine influence. I had to go out and seek it out uh, in my schools. I had to seek it out in, in, in popular culture, looking at men like Ben Carson and things of that sort that really inspired me, and it helped me. Was it the ideal? I guess to a traditionalist, it wouldn't be the ideal. But my point is this. When you're up against the rough terrain of reality, you're not going to be able to always perfectly apply the ideal to every circumstance. And therefore, you should conform your moral thinking to what would be, in this case, the best for the flourishing of the child. And if that means incorporating influences from both sides into the child's life, good. That will help them. That will help. Help them grow and flourish. So I think that Walsh is taking a very, again, his premise is sound, but he goes to a different place that that premise is warrant. And he's very narrow-minded in how he sees this issue. Let's keep going on. You know, it's true that some children grow up with one arm or no arms. But that obviously doesn't make it any more horrific or any less horrific or barbaric to intentionally chop a child's arm off. You know, the fact that some children end up that way, does, yes, but a child is supposed to have two arms at birth. And you, to, to intentionally design a child to only have one, we would all agree it's like, it's, it's like mad scientist uh, horror. But this is essentially what we're doing with commercial surrogacy. It only it's worse because it's far better for a child to be raised lacking one of his arms than to be raised lacking one of his parents. And that's why I will never applaud and cheer when we get these birth announcements from gay couples, because I'm more concerned about what the child needs than what those men want. Okay, so this is perhaps the most shocking, in my opinion, the most perplexing for me part of Walsh's commentary here. He says that it is better for a child to be born with one arm than to be born with one parent. Well, I speak again, speaking as a, as a product of a single parent household, when I think of my own challenges in life that were presented to me by not having a two parent household, and then I compare it to not having an arm, I think I can honestly say to you that the challenges that I have faced in my life from not having a two parent household have been marginal challenges that I have had to work through and that have made me the person I am today. They have made me the successful and grown man that I am today at 23 years old sitting here and talking to you. I had to learn how to cook at 12 years old and do laundry at 12 years old. I had, there's a lot of things I didn't understand going through 
high school that I had to understand and figure out myself. There were a lot of things I didn't understand going through college that I had to figure out and understand myself. But guess what? All of those disadvantages, I was able to take them and turn them into something good. Now, some of them may retort, well, Chris, not everyone's like you. Okay, maybe not, but guess what? Everyone has the capacity to do what I did. Your, your, your background does not have to determine your future. Where you come from does not have to determine where you end up at. Now, unfortunately for many people, it does. But a lot of that's not just not because fate has some gun pointing at their head directing them towards some indeterminable course. That, that would be a determinist argument that I reject. It's because a lot of people never learn or are never taught how to float above water, whether they come from a single-parent household or a two-parent household. There are a lot of nuclear households that themselves don't understand how to float above water, and that's why, why do you think divorces are so common? Well, well <laughs> that's a different story, different day. So that inner resilience has made me into the person that I am today. I don't know if I, if I had a two-parent household, if I would have turned out to be the man I am today. I really don't know. So I can look back and regret and say, yes, were the limitations? Of course there were. Were the things I missed out on? Of course there were. But I've been able to make up for those disadvantages. The disadvantages of not having a parent are marginal. The disadvantages of not having a limb, whereas not having a parent temporarily disadvantages you in some way. Not having a limb permanently disadvantages you and permanently limits the scope of your achievements, of your potential achievements in life. So in what universe is lacking a limb which permanently limits your ability to achieve things in life more than not having a parent does, a, a two-parent household does, is better than simply having to overcome a hardship that a lot of people, unfortunately, have to overcome today. Again, this, is a re this reflects not sound moral thinking born from consideration of the issues, not sound statistical thinking born from considerations of data. This reflects a personal bias that Matt has one that is probably born from disgust and a, a, a sort of romanticized, a romanticized union with the ideal that he then uses to inflict his vision of the world upon other people as opposed to looking at reality for how it actually is, seeing the rough terrain of reality as opposed to simply just seeing the map of the world that's supposed to tell you where everything is and how everything is. The map never tells you how everything is. Oftentimes, you'll find that the terrain is much more interesting when you actually get to touch it. And that's what makes life beautiful. You being able to touch and experience what, what, what is as opposed to you having an idea of what is and being able to interpret what is through your own processes that then allows you to destroy and contort what is uh, into your own way. This is what happens when, when doctors decide to go trans kids. They have an idea of what should be and they, they use that idea to manipulate, uh, correct, uh, correct, to manipulate the correct interaction with, with kids in that respect. It's wrong. It's absolutely 100% wrong. But this idealism produces that kind of thing. So no, it's not better for kids to have a, lose a limb than to have one parent. We have to understand that in a world where the ideal is not dominant, everything exists in degrees. And when we talk about degrees, and we talk about the sort of measured path towards greatness in degrees, some things are preferable over others, but everyone's situation is different. And we have to take that into account. I don't intend to refute all the arguments about surrog against surrogacy in this video. If you guys want me to, I'll do a longer video talking about that, that issue. It's talking about the general, and why I think that as a conservative, I can support surrogacy and I can also support gay families as well. And, and, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of insight on the latter point. If, if the traditional family is a matter of structure, then the content of the traditional family is secondary to the structure. Because the traditional family, the nuclear family is a form, it's a structure. Two parents at the top of the household. But if now it's that there can only be two parents that are one woman, one a man, the traditional family conforms more to content than it does structure, and therefore it compromises itself, compromises its integrity. Because no longer is about the structure being good, it's about 
the, 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 the sex and the identity of the people in the family being good. Both matter to some degree, but the structure is more important. And so if there are gay people that want to perpetuate society, because why is the family important? The traditional family is important because it, it, it allows more responsibility and virtue to be cultivated within a binding contractual relationship, i.e. marriage, where those two things are expected and those two things are enforced by the partners. This is why monogamy is a superior method, of, uh, the superior union in society, because it, it fosters moral virtue, it fosters moral responsibility, or at least it should. Unfortunately, a lot of folks get in there and don't actually understand what marriage is about, and so they don't really learn anything except how to, how to scam your partner out of money through alimony settlements. That's a different story, different day. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what that, that's, what, that's what the form of traditional marriage is about. But a lot of traditionalists will just discard that entirely when it comes to their apologism for their idea of the ideal. And that's wrong. That's not good. I think people like Guy Benson and his husband have the ability to be good fathers, good family men, like anyone else does, if in their character they have those qualities. And I don't know Guy Benson personally, but from what I've seen, from what I've observed over the years, it does seem that he has those qualities. And that's what should be the most important thing. I, I, I think that this hysteria over surrogacy and that kind of thing is not really born entirely of a care for the child or what they're missing. It's born primarily from an aversion to lifestyles that try to fit the traditional norm that people in that norm aren't willing to accept. And the sooner we could actually drill that down and confront that, the more sooner we could have a beneficial conversation about this topic and its, its consequences in our society. And I think that if people like Wash thought a little bit harder, they may be able to see the nuance and the color of this issue brings. My friends, like this video, comment on this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel. Be sure to, to donate to me if you want to keep my message out there. Um, be sure to also join my Discord in the comment section down below. My friends, study philosophy, study history, and most importantly, please stay pensive. Bye, guys.